ahead and we are recording. Okay. So we finished off last time talking about the myosin side of things, talking about that we have these individual myosin heads. They have different segments on them, right? Light and heavy neuromyosin, light chains, heavy chains, the actin binding side, et cetera, et cetera. So let's talk a minute about the kind of other side of all of this. Talk about the actin coat. Talk about thin coat. Right? So this here is what we have, is what an actin, an actin, an individual actin is going to look at, look like, sorry. They're little spheres, okay? D actin, individuals, F actin, they're kind of is a single kind of strand where we're putting them together. And then the actin filament that are going to be contained in our sarcomeres is going to be these, this kind of double helix looking thing where they're wound together and then they spiral off like so. Okay. On every actin molecule is a binding site for myosin. So one myosin head can make contact with, connect to one of those actin molecules, which will become important in the coming slide. There are two other things, though, that are on the thin filament, okay, two other proteins. There's a thing called tropomyosin, and then just this kind of rope-like structure that looks like this, and then another protein called troponin, which has these three subunits. A T subunit, an I, and a C cell. Okay? And so the importance of these two, troponin and tropomyosin, is they're considered regulatory proteins. What I mean by that is that they regulate the function or they regulate the ability of myosin to bind actin. Some people say they regulate actin. But what they really do is they regulate the availability of the myosin binding site on actin. Okay? So I make lots of toddler analogies now because I have a toddler and she sort of dominates everything. Tropomyosin is the equivalent to the little plastic things you put in the wall sockets to keep her from jamming a fork in there. Okay, that's what tropomyosin. So tropomyosin runs the length of the actin filament, and what it does is it lays over the top of and covers the myosin binding site. Therefore, it prevents myosin from being able to bind to actin. Okay, myosin is really creepy. It really wants to grab on to actin and hold on to it all the time. It wants to grab it and touch it. And be like, I want us to be a thing. Okay. It's the significant other that always wants to hold hands. Tropomyosin is like, no, no, stay away. And you can't quite be able to do all of that. Okay. Troponin then is going to exist not so much at every sort of actin molecule, but it's going to exist at these kind of regular intervals. And what troponin does is troponin is going to be connected to kind of anchored onto the tropomyosin, and it's going to be the protein that in certain times, it's going to change its conformational shape. It's going to bend or move. And when it does so, then it pulls the plug out of the wall socket. It's going to move the tropomyosin out of the way. And let the binding site be exposed. So then myosin can come over and hold hands back. Okay. So what goes on then, really, you can, this part is not really that. So the tropomyosin, you've got one of them for every sort of seven. Uh, kind of actin molecules, but it covers the binding site. The three subunits, the one that really, really is going to, it's going to matter is this the C subunit, troponin C. Troponin C binds to calcium. And so calcium is our signal. Calcium that comes out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum will bind onto the C subunit of troponin. Okay. And then it's going to, basically called the conformational change in the troponin shape, which pulls the tropomyosin off of the binding site and allows actin myosin to bind together. And then the calcium gets released off of the subunit and it pulls 
combine intro class and those kind of words and also all the subtract of the so So in this way, the thing to keep in mind is that normal resting state of a muscle is for tropomyosin to come to the binding time. So when you're resting, normal resting state is no binding. Okay. If it wasn't that, then you just walk around like a cramp all the time. Because myosin wants to bind to active. Always. Always, always, always. And so without this, then it would always be bound and you would be like a corpse. You'd be in like rigor mortis all the time. Okay. So this is resting state. So what we do basically is we use calcium and our process of getting calcium released by the central nervous system to release the calcium when we want a contraction, and then it goes back to resting state when it's going to contract. That's part of how we get questions about. Are you okay with all of that? That makes sense. So we've already talked about in the last slide that myosin really wants to buy the active. Okay. It really, really wants to bind. And when it does bind, okay, the myosin head interacts with one binding site. What it forms is something called a cross bridge. Okay. It's a cross bridge. So once you get a cross bridge, you're going to get force production. Okay. Now, that force production may or may not result in movement. It is not necessarily a guarantee. Okay, you guys want to see what I'm talking about? I mean, yeah, side, stand up for us. Right? Ty, how strong are you? <laughs> very strong, not very strong. All right, what do you guys think? Do you guys think that Cy can move the back wall if I ask him to push on it? No? Give it a try, Cy. Push on the wall. Try to be like the Kool Aid man and like. Run through there. <laughs> okay. So when I say that, thank you, Sai. Sai thinks push on wall. Boom, boom, boom. Signal, 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 signal. Calcium release. Bind to troponin. Move tropomyosin. Engage. Form cross bridges. Okay. Myosin binds to actin, and that myosin tries to pull. It tries to pull the actin. Okay, it generates a certain amount of force. What Psy just did, it's not going to move. It's trying to pull this direction. Okay, It's trying to execute something which is called a power stroke. The movement of it backwards, movement there is called a power stroke. Psy was not getting very many power strokes out of his muscles because the external load on the other end down here of the muscle was much greater than the force that could be generated by however many cross bridges he was engaging. Okay. So when you form a cross bridge, you will get force. That part is for sure. The movement, and we'll talk more about this probably next week, the movement that we get after that happens is going to be dependent upon what your external load is and how many cross bridges you can engage and the type of contraction that you're doing and a few other items, okay? But once we get to here, this is where we get force, okay? Whether it moves or not in some ways it is irrelevant, okay? All right, so there are some other, there's some other proteins that I want you all just to be aware of. I'm not really gonna ask you a lot of questions about them or anything else, but if you, read papers about skeletal muscle physiology where they take biopsies or they're looking at other aspects of sarcomeres and things of that nature. It's not just actin and myosin that are going to be contained. Okay. So there is nebulin and then this is going to be a thin filament um, protein. Okay. And it's going to play some role in the number of actin monomers, the individual actin molecules that are joined together. Okay. Then, especially at the Z line and kind of connected from the Z line into the filaments of the Z line, there's a thing called desmin and alpha actinin. Okay. And along with chitin, 
These three things are what we call structural proteins. Okay. Anybody ever you know, like to watch like shows on HGTV where they take it down, take the house down to the studs, and you see the framing basically and how all this works? Like you can pull the drywall off, and there's going to either be sort of metal or two by fours that they put up at regular intervals in this room to kind of give it structure. Okay, that's what alpha actinin and desmin will do. Okay, they're going to help everything anchor at the Z line and help hold each of the filaments. In their three dimensional place. Okay? If you don't have very many of these, then I pull on your muscle and it falls apart. Okay, which is not great. Titan does some of that. Titan is also elastic. And Titan, we now know, which is not included on this because this is a relatively new thing. Titan provides structure. It provides a level of elasticity, much like tendons and ligaments and collagen does. Titan is also all by itself a molecular motor, just like mine. And when you can generate force, in some specific instances, you're going to get force from myosin, and you're also going to get force from Titan. This is maybe the sort of like least reported, like least talked about, hugely paradigm shifting advanced in skeletal muscle physiology in 50 years, 100 years, okay? It isn't even really in, if you get an undergraduate exercise physiology textbook, they still just talk about that all force production comes from myosin. Okay? At some point, this it doesn't get enough, I don't know why, but it doesn't get enough, um, doesn't get enough sort of things. So I got to the University of Ontario, his name was Walter Herzog, and they discovered this about 10 years ago or thereabouts. They have videos, like you can see under an electron microscope, you can see the Titan moving individual sarcomeres all by itself. It really comes into play when you stretch muscles and you do some weird kind of crazy things. It's mind blowing. Okay. So I just want you guys to appreciate that these are things that people will talk about. We oftentimes will use alpha actinin kind of as a, as a regulatory marker when you're doing like biopsy samples. If you're looking at other proteins and things, you use the actinin levels kind of as a constant um, to look and see what other things are changing or you will normalize it to the alpha actinin level because it tends to be pretty constant. So just things to keep in mind. Okay, there's a lot of other stuff that goes going on here. All right. So we're going to shift a little bit from the muscle side of things, and do a little bit of anatomy of the nervous system, right? Again, this is really just some very bare bones, high points, so we're not gonna do hardly any sort of actual brain structures or anything else. If you're interested in that, there's some great neuroscience classes in the biology department, okay? There's even a couple in psych that I would recommend you guys that you can take. We're just gonna do enough to be able to speak with some mild level of expertise. Okay. So when I say central nervous system, what I really mean is brain and spinal cord. Okay. So initiation of muscle contractions is going to take place in the motor cortex. That's going to get transmitted down the spinal cord and be integrated at what we are going to call alpha motor neurons, which are going to be individual neuron cell bodies that exist in the spinal cord, and they are going to be the cells that will send their axons out that will eventually terminate very close to individual muscle fibers at the neuromuscular junction, and will transfer our nervous system signal over to the muscle. Okay, so the central nervous system, as we said, it has these things, there are approximately 250 million muscle fibers in the body, right? You've got about 450,000 motor neurons. So way more fibers than there are motor neurons. So the take home from that is, huh, I guess individual motor neurons have to connect to more than one muscle fiber, right? That in fact is how all of this is working. So, Every muscle fiber in your body is going to be connected to a motor neuron. Right? If it works, it's connected to a motor neuron. 
each motor neuron is going to connect itself to multiple fibers. Okay. And we'll kind of talk about why that's going to be the case, how that helps us, but it sets up a situation that looks like this. We have a motor neuron in the spinal cord, it sends one axon out, and then that axon is going to branch and then make connections on multiple muscle fibers. Okay. So the motor neuron and the collection of muscle fibers to which it connects, that's termed a motor unit. Okay. When we start talking about how the nervous system turns on and controls force production either Wednesday or next week, it's the motor unit level, the motor units that are going to be the things that are really, really important. Okay. okay. So the number of fibers that are connected to a given motor neuron or the size of our motor unit is generally going to relate to the particular function and the fiber type of those sort of that muscle and that motor. Okay. Muscles that are big, very often, like your quads or your glutes or something, are going to have very large motor units. Okay. They're going to have one motor neuron connecting to thousands of muscle fibers. Muscles that are very small, or muscles that are small and control very precise movements. Think the muscles that control your hands, okay, the movement of your fingers, are going to tend to have smaller motor units, fewer fibers connected to every motor neuron. They're also going to tend to have fewer motor neurons, which is a separate issue. Okay. But things that allow for more precise motor control tend to have smaller motor units. Things that are big, their goal is just lots of raw brute force, okay? quads, glutes, right? your lats, things like that are going to tend to have bigger motor units. So again, structure is in some ways related to function. We'll do some examples next week on what happens if that stuff gets kind of turned around. Okay. Motor neurons are located in very specific places in your spinal cord. Right. They are located, what I would say, top to bottom in relation to sort of the top to bottom structure of your muscles. Okay. So if you look here, see diaphragm, it's strange to me, maybe it is to you initially, the diaphragm is located sort of the highest. The diaphragm is at like C3, C4. And then we kind of work our way down. Deltoids, biceps, wrists, tricep, hands, right? These things are in the cervical vertebrae. There's not a lot of motor neurons, sort of the skeletal muscle, um, a little bit to sort of the abdominal region, internal, external, intercostals that are in the thoracic vertebrae. And then you get down into the lumbar, You've got most of your kind of lumbar down into kind of S1, maybe it may spill over into S2 a little bit, um, kind of lower body motor neurons are going to be there. Okay, so it kind of works from up to down. All of the motor neurons that connect to a particular muscle are located in a very similar place in the spinal. Right? So let's just pick. All of our tricep motor neurons are going to be in and around C7. Okay? It's not like you have some at C7 and some down here at T7 and some at L2 and some at S1. They're all in the same place. Okay? Very tightly bunched together. All right, very tightly bunched together. Okay? So why do you guys think the diaphragm is going to be kind of the highest up, the closest up here to the brain. You guys think of a reason why that might be a useful thing? We do need to breathe, Christine. Yes. But why would having it be higher be better? Because that the travel is far, okay? If it's on the I want to say, around the spine, mm -hmm. if there's an injury, say, to the lumbar vertebrae or even the thoracic vertebrae, then that knocks out the possibility of being able to breathe. Yeah. Because paraplegics, 
that is not very sort of adaptively beneficial, right? Yeah. From an evolutionary standpoint. If let's just say it was down here, so the problem is there's there's good and bad to motor neuron location. Okay, good and bad. The bad will start with the bad. The bad is if you get damage to the spinal cord, then everything that is south of where the injury is is gone. Okay. Or if you get damaged in one area, you may lose the function of like all of the motor neurons in that particular location if the cord is not completely separate. Okay. So they're all in the same place. And so that would be bad from an injury standpoint. You can injure all of them or everything. What might be good? So the diaphragm being high, right? The higher up we go, the less likely, right, you are to put as much sort of stress and strain on those things. If you have a fall or you have an accident or something, right? If you talk about it in theory, I mean, it's still, you know, kind of exposed, but less likely to maybe get hit right here. If you think. So that might be useful from the diaphragm standpoint. So if the downside is that you get damaged and everything can be gone, what's, why would, what's the advantage? Why is it good to have them all in the same place? How might that outweigh? But you want to guess? Less confusion. Less confusion. Okay. It's like the signal is not good to certain areas, not traveling throughout your body. So okay. Things can go wrong. Okay. Less things can go wrong. And that's on the right on the right track. So it's like going back to your example, triceps. Mm -hmm. If they weren't located at C7, say half of them were located at C7 and half were located at like T10 or something like that, the ones located at C7 would get the signal faster than the ones located at T10. So there could be a recruitment issue. There okay. very much could be a recruitment issue. Yes. Some could get turned on before others, right? Remember that we need to precisely control force and precise timing in order to generate the movements that we want. Not only can things go wrong, but it's just muscle movements can be very herky jerky. You guys are absolutely right. So the advantage of them all being together is when I send a signal from the motor cortex to say, hey, triceps turn on, it all goes to the same place and they can, I can in theory turn all of them on if I need to at almost the exact same instant time. Right? That's better than some are up here and some are down there. Well, we think about the nerve transmission is really fast, but the ones that are closer to the motor cortex would be polarized first. They're going to go, and then these are going to go, and then these are going to go in some ways, and that might not be nearly as beneficial. Right? So that's kind of why it's going to function. That particular way. Okay, so this is just showing in many ways a kind of cartoon cross section. Uh, we've got S2 here, we've got L4 up here, so we've got like L5 and S1 kind of in here. So you've seen sort of a three to four vertebrae slice of things, and these little cylinders are ways to denote kind of where in all of this are the, the motor neurons are going to be located in that particular way. Okay, so you can see like quads are here, and then TA is clearly distal to that. Um, I find it funny on this, they're saying calf muscles, like the, you know, they mean, right, the gastrox, the soleus, those kinds of things. Um, and then it says foot muscles, like there are specific foot muscles. And I always find it hilarious that the glutes are distal to the quads, but it is, you know, in some ways, kind of whatever it is. All right. Important to keep in mind that the alpha motor nerve, are going to be located, the cell bodies are in the ventral horn, okay? So they're on the inside. If you're thinking about in your spine, they're on the inside, ventral horn of the gray matter. So here's the inside, here's the ventral side, here's the back, here's the dorsal side, okay? And so most of your motor neurons are going to be located here, right? And then all of the axons that come off of those things are going to get bundled together and they're going to leave the spinal cord in the same place. And one big nerve bundle and that's going to exit out. And then eventually out here in the same nerve bundle, we're going to have individual 
sort of axons from that are going to lead back to afferent um, afferent neurons that are going to be here that are going to receive sensory input. But those are going to be on the dorsal side here. And there's inner neurons. So in the spinal cord and in, within your brain, there are these the cell bodies of the, the motor neurons. But then there's afferent neurons, but between all of them are these things called interneurons, which are just other cells, other nerve cells, and their job, they're kind of the middle people when you play the game of telephone. They're going to tell, they're going to, this, this thing tells me something, I tell it to Elise, and then Elise tells it to me. So it's, sometimes we get this interneuron communication. Again, there's a lot of stuff that can happen where the interneurons can either Excite or inhibit, make it easier and more difficult for the motor neurons to fire. There's a whole lot of stuff that goes into kind of how we regulate that that is really beyond the scope of our class, but is really fascinating. Okay? Really, really fascinating. Okay, so this is the general structure of a motor neuron. You got the cell body, it has dendrites, they're going to surround all of these little thin, wispy structures. Dendrites are going to pick up information from other interneurons or other kind of cell bodies or signals that are around it, right? There's a nucleus, there's a nucleolus that are going to be in here. They're going to make all the stuff that the nerve needs to stay healthy. We have this place down here called the axon hillock, which is the place immediately proximal to the axon. And it's going to play a significant role in deciding if the, the, the motor neurons are going to polarize. You can have your axon that comes off, it's long, and it's going to move out and connect near the muscles. The axon branches, and you're going to get these axon terminals that are going to come down. And they're going to have these little bulb-like structures on the end that are called the synaptic knob or a bouton. And this is going to be the place that's going to interact specifically with the individual muscle fiber. Along the axon, for your motor, on the motor side, you're going to have something called myelin, which is uh, basically fat. That is wrapped around the, the axon. It makes it lighter, it makes the diameter go up, and it provides insulation and it actually speeds up the transmission of an action. There. Interspersed with the myelin are these things that are called nodes of Ron VA, which are these little areas where there are not, there's not uh, myelin, but very, very high concentrations of sodium um, uh, acid channels. In the undergraduate textbook, I don't know how Dr. Mike teaches it or what you get if you've had human phys here, but they talk about that action potentials jump from one node to the next node to the next node. That's not 100% actually what happens. It sort of goes under and then doesn't really jump on the outside. But in general, this allows us, okay, having myelin and the nodes of Ron VA concentrating these things in, in very heavily in individual places. This allows us to increase the speed of transmission of an action potential down your axon. Okay. So just appreciate that, right? I've got to send an axon from, say, back here at maybe S2 or something, all the way down to the muscles that control, control the movements of my toes. I'm not a particularly tall person, okay? As my wife likes to point out to me. Uh, she's five foot three, I'm five foot ten. Our legs are exactly the same length, okay? She is all arms and legs and no midsection. She loves shopping for pants. She does not. I, on the other hand, I'm all midsection and I have little baby T-Rex arms and little baby T-Rex legs, okay? We're hoping that somehow this all gets evened out and Ellis is like perfectly kind of normally proportioned. Um, so far, it looks like she's taking after me, which we'll see how that goes. Okay. My point was that I still have several feet of axon that has to run from S2 all the way down there. I put my foot on something that is hot or cold or sharp, and I've got to move my foot or get it out of the way. I got to send that information down there really fast. So the myelin becomes really, really important. There are conditions under which you lose the myelin. Okay, when that happens, I don't want to say you're fucked, but you're not in great place. It dramatically slows down. Okay, dramatically slows down transmission. You can lose force production. 
can have all kinds of problems. My best friend in college had something called Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is an autoimmune disorder where your immune system attacks the myelin and eats it away. He, had, like, he couldn't move. It's very scary for us. Um, so I mean, this is you know a guy who's on the baseball team with me and went from like one day he was fine to two days later, like he could barely like walk and do those things and he couldn't go very fast. The myelin was gone. So there are things that can happen. Okay, we kind of talked about these things. I want to I want to mention very, very briefly again things that are kind of wild to me. So the axon has a huge number of what we call cytoskeletal proteins in it, microfilaments and microtubes that provide like a highway. Okay. Motor neuron at S2, neuromuscular junction down there near my foot. All of the things, acetylcholine, everything else that needs to, that's needed in that neuromuscular junction has to get made by the nucleus in my spinal cord in the alpha motor neuron. And so we use these microtubules and microfilaments and things to help us walk or transport stuff from the motor neuron all the way down the axon, all the way down there, okay? It can take a while to do all of this, which I hope will make it more important to you guys as to why we're really efficient at, we release a little bit of acetylcholine, and we wanna recycle as much of it as we can. Because we have to make more and bring it down from the nucleus that may take days. Okay. So that's what's going on there. There's some dendrites, blah, blah, blah. We talked about all of this kind of thing. Um, a synapse. So the connection between the axon terminal and a muscle fiber is called a synapse. Okay. Sure you guys have all heard that word before. Specifically in the neuromuscular system, we tend to call it these days the neuromuscular junction. At various points throughout history, it's been called the motor end plate. They're all talking about the same thing. Okay. The important thing is that it doesn't touch. There's no touching. Okay. We're going to get down to the very, very end. Okay. A couple of these slides are out of order. I apologize. Okay. Back up. I thought I had a picture right after this. Do, do, do. At the junction, there's no touching. There's a little bit of space. And I guess we will talk about what that structure looks like in a few slides. I thought it was about to be right now, but and I was off. Okay. So these things, this is showing myelin and the swan cells, swan cells that make them. So let's talk about the motor unit. See, you can see. We've got our motor neurons in the spinal cord, right? They're going to send their axon out. It's connecting to sort of multiple different muscle fibers that are going to be there. Here you can see, right? You can see the actual axon terminals. You can see the motor end plate or the neuromuscular junctions that are, that are going to happen down here. Note how it's a very highly kind of specific and, and diverse structure that's going to be here. One axon is branch is going to come in. And then at the junction, there's going to be all of these kind of little branchy things that are going to come off. You will note the kind of little bulbs or knobs that are going to be at the very end there. They're going to increase our surface area around the junction to make sure we've got more space to release acetylcholine and more places to recapture that acetylcholine. Okay. So talked about that already. Ah, here's the slide that I was doing. Okay, so here's our junction. This is what it looks like, okay? I'm gonna get things here. And so on the nerve side, it expands out to increase surface area. On the muscle side, it folds to increase surface area, okay? So this area right here is called the primary cleft of the neuromuscular junction. And then these folds on the bottom are called the secondary cleft, okay? All along on the sarcolimal side here, in the cleft and down into these secondary clefts, this is going to be lined with receptors that are gonna be um, attached to sodium channels. And they're going to be receptors for the primary neurotransmitter here, which is called acetylcholine. So 
You get an action potential from the motor cortex. It moves its way through the nervous system. The motor neuron depolarizes. You get an action potential all the way down. It reaches here the bouton or the, the bulb end of the axon terminal. That electrical signal causes calcium to be sort of moved in. There's voltage gated calcium channels here. Calcium moves in and it tells these little vesicles that have acetylcholine to integrate themselves with the membrane and dump their acetylcholine out here into the primary and secondary plaque. That acetylcholine binds to the acetylcholine receptor. That receptor then is going to open the sodium channel. Sodium rushes in, and we're going to start the action potential process all over again. Okay. So the importance of the increase in surface area is that it maximizes area for contact so that we can release lots of acetylcholine and then we can capture it very easily and very efficiently on the muscle side, okay? That way we, do, we don't lose a lot, we, we can recycle it, and we can take it back up from here rather than having to bring it back from the axis, okay? So now we talked about this, we've gotten these things. The other thing to keep in mind here is in the basement membrane of the, of the sarcolemma, there's an enzyme called acetylcholinesterase. Okay. Acetylcholinesterase breaks acetylcholine off of its receptor and stops transmission from the nervous system to the muscle. That's our stop signal. Okay. And so there's some really crazy, interesting things about cholinesterase and cholinesterase inhibitors. Okay. Uh, lots of neurotoxins either spiders or snakes or puffer fish or things make that can do one of two things. Uh, they'll either sort of cause too much binding or they'll block the function of acetylcholinesterase. So be these cholinesterase inhibitors. Um, in some ways, not super pertinent. I hope not on wood for one more day, but we were to look at things like in Afghanistan, but like in Syria, they were using like sarin nerve gas and those kinds of things. It affects the cholinesterase and these things. And so what happens is you eat puffer fish that was not prepared right because you know you've gone to Japan and you eat it raw. The chef doesn't know what he's doing, and it puts a cholinesterase inhibitor, and you can't break all of this, and your diaphragm can't relax, and you die. There's fun things that go on with all of that. That's like paralysis or uh, full on, like you're stuck in a tonic contraction and you can't let go. Yeah, either way, not great. And I may have the puffer fish thing backwards. It may block acetylcholine release. You can't get a contraction. I don't remember, but there's plenty of things. Most neurotoxins do one of those two things. You either get a tonic muscle contraction that you can't release. So that after a couple of minutes, you're fatigued and then you can't continue to contract, so you can't breathe, or you can't make it contract, and so you still can't breathe. So, lots of not great things that go on. Okay. So, before we come back and talk about kind of motor neurons, this is probably as good a place as any for us to talk about fiber tunnels. Okay. So, we don't do these here, but we did them when I was a PhD student at Georgia. We could do them, we just don't. Um, they do some at the Health Science Center. So I don't know, Jordan, if you guys have ever seen any. They do them all at Omar F. Ben Miller's lab, they've been doing some, um, but it's called a muscle biopsy. And what you guys are seeing here is uh, a traditional, it's called a Bergstrom biopsy. And what we do is you, you give a person a little bit of local anesthetic, okay? Now, instead of blocking the acetylcholinesterase, we're blocking the function of uh, sensory nerves, um, as well as probably the, the ability to get a little bit of local anesthetic. You make a very small incision, you know, about a centimeter or thereabouts. Into that, you insert a needle that is not quite as big around as a pencil. Sorry, Joel. Um, yes, if I had done that, like the know, but I know the principle. I know someone who works in. That you know somebody that works in that lab, yeah. So, are they doing the full arms? Or are they doing? You can do this with a micro. It's called a micro biopsy. If you just want a little bit of tissue to do, like look at messenger RNA expression or you can do PCR, where you don't need that much tissue. You can do it with a micro biopsy. You don't even get local. It's like a hypodermic needle. You just dump it in there. So my guess is they're doing the full. Most people will do the full. 
So we used to do those here, and then the guys that did them got a foul with the IRB and got shut down. So I don't know, Gabe, did you all find the old the needles still downstairs? Why the hell they're collectors I items? Might. You might still have it. He's like, I don't know. We might there used to be that. But anyway, you make an incision, you insert this needle that looks like this, you put suction on one end, and it has this window, and you you apply some suction and it pulls a piece of muscle into this window, and then you plunge the um, you plunge the end down, and in the window, it's like a guillotine. And it has the little the knife edge is here, and so you pull some into the needle and then it slices. And it captures the piece in there, and you pull it out, and it looks like an eraser. Okay. And then some poor grad student like me has to take said biopsy, and you have to mount it with a little like piece of gum onto a popsicle stick, and then you dunk said thing into like the nitrogen and you freeze it, and then you have to go and cut these little very very thin uh, sections of it that you mount on slides. And then Visualize the individual muscle fibers and their individual cross sections. Okay? This technique was developed in, in the 60s. And at the time, the biopsy technique, in conjunction with what the advances in molecular biochemistry, completely revolutionized exercise physiology. Because until then, we had no idea what was going on inside muscles. We had no idea when your muscle got bigger when you trained what was happening at the fiber room. We had no information about how much glycogen was in those muscles. We had no idea about what its myosin could do, how much ATP it used, any of these kinds of things. There was no way to see inside of a muscle. Okay? There are some uses for this now, but we've basically exhausted the vast majority of those uses. So it's very, it's not very commonly done anymore. Okay? So you do all of those. So one of the first things they figured out when they were taking biopsies is that not every muscle fiber was the same. That's a good question. How much does that change the, the surrounding tissue? Yeah. It's not great. Um, pretty sore for a few days afterwards. Um, and, and those and it's kind of like having a tattoo. You got to wrap it in, in cellophane. You can't get that shit wet. Used to get infected. Mm -hmm. um, people would come back into the lab and you know, we like dump iodine like into it and everything every couple of days to make sure that it was it was still doing all right. Um, so you're pretty you're pretty sore. Um, we did one study. We would usually we would pay people a hundred bucks a sample that we would take. I think we had one study where we took eleven or twelve biopsies over the course of two weeks. Mm -hmm. So like they would come. We took several on the first day from the same hole, um, which is not the most advisable kind of thing. So we were doing, we were looking at markers, changes in insulin like growth factor and some things in the muscle. And so they would come, and you'd get some pre-biopsies, and then we would we'd have them exercise, then we'd take some, like take one during exercise, and stop, we'd take one, do some more exercise, and then take them at various kind of time points afterwards. Um, and then they'd come back a couple of days later when the, um, and we'd have them exercise again sometimes and not take a biopsy on that day so they didn't get any, they, they wouldn't get any local. And you got to try to exercise. Like, I mean, you've had surgery. That was the worst part. Like, once you get the local, like, it's fine. It's pressure. It's not that big of a deal, right? Um, but some of the stuff afterwards, we had people who would, like, throw up and stuff. Like, it was, it was pretty, it's pretty wild. I think about that now and I'm like, there was not a lot of IRB oversight. Like this was really maybe not, there was just kind of the wild west of doing whatever. So you like were drinking. I mean the fact that you like pain now. A little bit, yes. <laughs> um, I did at least have the um, so the guy that I worked for, um, he was the one that would take he would take the biopsies and then in the summer that I joined the lab, he had a car accident and had sort of a traumatic brain injury as a part of that. It was relatively mild, but he lost some of his motor control kind of on the inside. And so they would wildly enough like let us as students take the biopsies. Um, I never took one. I like this seems like a bridge too far, but part of my dissertation study, we were wanting to look at 
some stuff. And he was like, no, like we'll get, you know, we'll get this one guy to come down and he can sit in there. Like we'll get an MD to come and sit and just be there in case you like do something real crazy, but you can just take the biopsies. And I'm like, no, I'm good. You only have to come from. We can do without the, we can do without the molecular data. But, but, okay, what we learned from biopsies initially was that there are different types of muscle fibers. Okay. And so when you get a biopsy, you take it and you take these, do I have a picture somewhere? You get these serial cross sections. And so they look kind of like this. I don't have an actual, I do. here's some actual ones. Oh, this brings back memories. Um, but you take them and you cut them, but they're so like paper thin that you can see through them. Okay. And so you call them serial sections. And so we would cut like three or four consecutively. So you're they're basically identical. And then you would take one and you could do and you could stain it for the myosin ATPase enzyme speed. Right. Okay? And then from all of that you could see, well, what's our fiber type based upon myosin ATPA speed? Is it fast? Is it slow? Okay. You could then basically have an identical slice, even though it's just slightly proximal or distal to it, and you could stain for the metabolic enzymes. You could look for Krebs cycle enzymes like succinate dehydrogenase, or you could look for a lactate dehydrogenase. You could look for hexokinase, which is the enzyme that traps glucose in the cell start a glycolysis, okay? You could look for intracellular lipids. You could look for glycogen levels. And what would happen is you'd have an ATPA stain. You'd have the next section, you'd have the SDH stain. You could match the fibers up exactly. So you have, here's our ATPA speed. Here's that exact same fiber. Here's how much SDH it has or LDH it has. Here's how much glycogen it has. And so from all of that, and then some poor grad student, circle it, and you'd figure out what its diameter is. And you could calculate sort of an area and all of these things. All you repeat how long the fiber was. And so from all of this, it let us gain a tremendous amount of information of what's going on inside those cells. And so the primary ways that they initially identified fiber types was that you would just incubate and then with certain substrates like ATP. And then you would stain based upon what all was going on there. And what they found was that if you varied the pH in the muscle, that myosin ATPA speed would look either light or dark, uh, depending upon if it was a fast myosin ATPase or a slow myosin ATPase. So from this, we decided, oh, look, we have fast switch fibers or slow twitch fibers. Right? You can sort of separate things out like that. Correspondingly, you could take individual muscle fibers that you get from a biopsy. Um, I should have put a picture in here, and you can rig up the individual fibers with a force transducer, and you can make those individual fibers contract. One little fiber contract. And then based upon that, you can get a force tracing. And you can figure out what is the front end, like how quickly does it generate force? How quickly does that force turn off and relax? And it tracks with the minus and ATPA speed. You've got some that it goes up really fast in the fast switch muscle. They look like their twitch looks like this. The slow twitch one, it may look like that. So this is time like on the x-axis, and this is force on the y-axis. I apologize, I should have drawn that better. Okay. You can calculate sort of rate of force development. So what's the slope here basically, or rate of relaxation, what's the slope there? You can compare those things, and it's going to track with speed. That's where fast and slow from a fiber type standpoint came from. Okay. You want a slow twitch fiber develops force pretty damn fast. Like in, in you think about like anything, you can get I have a girl who's on the cross country team in my undergraduate class. She's probably primarily a slow twitch person, but I mean she can still like pull her hands off and stuff. It's, it's still fast, but it's just slower than fast twitch. With the advent of immunohistochemistry, where we could develop monoclonal antibodies and things to very specific sort of domains of things, right? That's the beauty in some ways, like the fact that the mRNA vaccine, you can target that one very specific spike protein. 
where you target the very little specific mutation in that spike protein. With immunohistochemistry, we have antibodies that can pull down the individual heavy chain. Okay? What we learned from all of this was that, oh, all of our fast switch fibers are actually not the same. Right? There's several flavors of fast switch fiber. And there are primarily, a okay, primarily two or three myosin heavy chain isoforms in human skeletal muscle. Okay? So ATPase is fast and slow. MHC is what that stands for myosin heavy chain. We're going to talk about type 2A. This is so type 1 is a slow twitch. Their heavy chain is all basically the same. We call it type 1. Fast switch has fast switch 2A and fast switch 2X primarily. They were originally called 2B, but 2B exists mostly in animal models, mostly in rats and cats and those kinds of things. You gotta really, really, really be inactive to get some 2Bs in, in humans. You'll see a few. Okay, we would see some in the spinal cord guys, but most of you guys, if you have really your fastest fibers are going to be these two X's, okay, and then you're going to have these two A's, and then we now know there's all of these, there's hybrid fibers that exist on a spectrum in between all of these things, all right, so there's like two AX and two XA and, and, and things that are going to be there, and I see you, Drew, and the part of this is that the myosin ATPase is probably pretty similar in all of this, but the two A's metabolically are going to look very different than the two X's, right? Okay? Two A fibers tend to have a lot of mitochondria or have the capacity to have a lot of mitochondria. Two X fibers, no mitochondria, okay? Two X fibers are like a hummer, right? They get like one mile to the gallon. You can track them twice, they're tired, they're fatigued, they're out of ATP. Two A's, they can do okay, right? If you train them, they can, they can kind of have quite a bit of mitochondria. They're not nearly as fuel efficient as ones, but they're a lot better than these, than these X's and then the hybrids are going to be somewhere potentially in the field. Certainly. So you said like a cross-country runner will kind of have more slow switch and then you apply to like an inactive person will have more QP. So it's not really a genetic thing. It's like a... No, no. So it's both. I, have a, I think, is it on the next slide? No, okay, so we'll talk about it now. Your fiber type is genetically determined, okay? Your percentage of fast and slow is gonna be within maybe five to 10% of each other in every muscle in your body, and it's genetically determined, okay? If you have lots of slow twitch fibers, Slow twitch fibers tend to be more metabolically efficient. And if you train from an endurance standpoint, they can develop a lot of mitochondria. So people with lots of slow twitch fibers have the potential to be very good distance athletes. Okay? They're probably not going to be great sprinters, hence they're slow twitch. They can run very fast, potentially. Anybody watch the Olympics, right? I tell you guys the fact the speed at which the marathon guys run or the girls run like one mile a lot of us would be hard pressed to sprint to keep up with so they're still fast but they're not like an elite level sprinter okay you cannot unless you have a spinal cord injury or you're uber uber inactive you cannot change your relative percentage of slow twitch to fast twitch fibers. Right? Most of you are 60 40 one way or the other. The vast majority of people are 60 40 one way. Right? Within a person, your diaphragm is your slowest muscle, which makes sense, right? It's been contracting for a long time and never really gets tired. Right? It's kind of like cardiac muscle. We talk about cardiac muscle, you'll figure out that cardiac muscle, like 40% of its volume is mitochondria. That's why your heart's been beating your entire life. You don't ever have to worry about it. Okay. Can you imagine if you were doing like bicep curls, like every time your heart beat, how tired your freaking bicep would be? Okay. You have lots of those. 2A and 2X. Very fast, not so metabolically efficient. 
elite, elite, elite sprinters are 85, 90% type two. Okay. You want to read some fascinating stuff. Uh, there's a book called The Sports Gene, and it talks about that genetically, people of West African descent, so Nigeria, those places, and then therefore like Jamaica and the Caribbean countries, and then Americans who have, or folks that have descent, their ancestors came from West Africa which were the primary places where Europe and the United States got their slaves, they tend to be more type two. East Africa, Ethiopia, those places, slow twitch. You know, the great distance from. <coughs> and so you can see this dichotomy sort of within you know, Africa. And there's more, they don't really understand some of the stuff about why even the some of the guys and the girls that are from Ethiopia and East Africa and the altitude and kind of how, why they're such great distance runners. You find sort of Americans or other folks that are of equal fiber type percentages to those folks and they still tend to not be as good. There's a lot of other stuff that goes in there, but that's kind of where this comes from. Elite sprinters, you tend to get a little bit more force out of twos than you do out of ones. They tend to be a little bit bigger. That's why. You can, within your type two fibers, shift the percentage of their A's and X's in the fiber. Okay. When you are inactive, it shifts towards X. You do any kind of activity whatsoever, running, walking, whatever, anything, lifting, no matter what, anything, X's become A's, okay? X's are wildly inefficient. It's not evolutionarily good to have a lot of X's, right? You think we evolved from hunter-gatherers, we were very, very active. So it tends to drive this, okay? You can, you can curl a bunch of mitochondria into two A's. So if you've got a lot of two A's, which most of us do, even if you're 50-50, you can train and put a lot of mitochondria into those and be a pretty reasonable distance out, right? It's much, much easier as we'll see at the end of the semester. It's much easier. I can train all of you to be better distance athletes no matter where you're starting from. You're either gonna be a sprinter or you're not, right? Like there's not a lot that I can do. I can, you can do all the squats you want. We can fix all your form. All we want, I can make you maybe a little bit faster. But a lot of that is just a genetic thing in those ways. That's all I can. And I can make all of you, we could probably, I could get all of you to run 5K in your 20 minutes or in your 19 minutes if you just want to train. She was like, what? Yeah, you can do it. Y'all are young. It's about want to and train. I may not be able to. That's kind of what goes on. So does that kind of answer your question, Drew? Very well. Okay. Matt, somebody, did you have a question earlier? Somebody else over here? Matt? Um, like, I have no idea why they go that way. I've never actually thought about that in that particular way. I don't know. Because it makes no sense. It makes no sense to have excess. Um, they're really metabolically inefficient. You get a lot of strength out of them. You get a lot of explosive power out of them. But that's good for life. One jump or two. So even if you were thinking like, well, I've been injured and I've been sedentary, and someone's going to try to come and attack me, like fight or flight. But yeah, like you know, you got to kill it with the first thing, or else you can't run away. So I don't know. That's a great question. What about not using that? I don't think so. I, I. That would also be a thing. Like, are these somehow like more silent for these, and they require less energy at rest? I, I don't think that's the case. So I don't know. I don't know why they do this. It would be interesting to know why. So in like lower animals, right? You can imagine if you're like a prey animal or something, having two bees, the two bees tend to be even faster than the X. It's like having these, like I need to be able to get away from something right now. And it doesn't matter. I got to get back to my little hole in my burrow to get away. It doesn't matter that I need to run for forever. So anyway. Yep. 
There's also a thought process that evolutionarily that what we're really good at, in addition to being able to be like, we're like the best sort of endurance athletes in the animal world, like we're kind of the pinnacle. We're also really good at thermal regulation. So what they used to, if they think that we would do is people would chase the deer. Like you would run the deer for hours until it would overheat and fall over and then and you kill it. Right? And so we're much, much better at sort of, we, when you make energy, you make a lot of heat. We're much better because our surface area to volume ratio is better suited for that unless you're an offensive lineman. Football. And a lot of animals are. Plus, we don't have you know, the fuss of fur and all of those things. We, you know, we sweat, they don't. So, that's today's lessons in evolutionary exercise physiology. So, we're at 415, so we'll go ahead and stop here today. We'll pick up with some of this stuff, probably fiber types. You guys can see some more information there, that kind of stuff. Talked about that. We'll take off with a little bit of this data here um, from Costa's lab. They got me to be an exercise physiologist on Wednesday. Okay. Yes. So.